this computer. All right. Um, so uh, I'm going to share my screen now. All right. Can I get a thumbs up if you guys can see Vet Dojo on the screen? Thumbs up if you can see. Yep. Great. All right. So um, this, I'd like this to be a discussion. So if you have questions, please either pipe in, unmute yourself, and ask a question, or if um, if you prefer, you can use the chat. Let me just open the chat box so that um, I can see if people are asking me questions. So what I thought I would do here is um, just review uh, our top videos in and have a discussion about my decision making process during the procedure and that sort of thing. And I'll be honest, the reason um, I started doing videos originally was um, I went to a lecture um, by Howard Syme. I'm sure you guys all know who Howard Syme and he's a great soft tissue surgeon at Colorado State University. He was my next door neighbor. And um, I had all these boring PowerPoint uh, slides and then he just put up about 20 minutes worth of video and talked for six hours about it on abdominal exploratories. And it was one of the most riveting lectures I've ever seen. And that's when I first started getting into video. Um, and I think that you can relay just so much information. They say if a picture is worth a thousand words, a video is worth a million words. Um, so that's how I first started getting into video. So we'll get started with our first one. Um, this was a tibial fracture repair um, that I did in a dog. And interestingly, um, <laughs> this was our most popular video we've ever had with about 300,000 views. And it turns out that um, a lot of the popularity with this video was the fact that people thought this was a human leg because I didn't put in a dog um, originally when I published this video. And, um, and so apparently there are people out there that just uh, surf the web looking for human surgery to watch even though they're not healthcare professionals and very clearly not healthcare professionals based on the questions that they're asking and that kind of thing. So I thought that, thought that was kind of funny. Um, anyway, so with tibial fractures in dogs and cats, um, most commonly we see mid-shaft diaphyseal fractures. Sometimes we see metaphys proximal metaphyseal fractures. Sometimes we see Salter Harris fractures um, of the proximal or distal um, physis and epiphysis. But the diaphyseal tibial fracture is um, one of the most common ones that we see. And if you're thinking about getting into fracture repair, uh, tibial fractures are probably a good one to start with because the approach is very easy. It's very difficult to mess up the approach. Um, basically, all you have to do is feel your own tibia and see where the bone is closest to the skin. And that's on the medial aspect. And so that's what our approach is going to be is a medial approach to the tibia. And uh, there isn't a lot that gets in the way. Uh, you can retract the saphenous vein um, caudally or cranially. You don't have to cut through that. And there really isn't a lot that, you know, especially with the diaphyseal tibial fracture, there's not a lot of trouble that you're going to get, you know, that you can get into. So we're going to make our incision all the way down to the bone. And if it's a young dog, um, it's going to have a fairly prominent periosteum. And that periosteum, um, if you peel it off the bone, is going to cause a very profound uh, callus formation and, and uh, bony proliferation. And so often that happens, particularly if you're trying to, um, to uh, do a, an open um, uh, anatomical reduction of the tibial fracture. So let's um, take a minute and talk about mid-shaft diaphyseal tibial fracture. And I apologize that I don't have the radiographs up here, but just imagine a mid-shaft, long oblique tibial fracture in a, you know, in a six-month-old dog. Um, what are our treatment options for this? So can you guys please in the chat write down your treatment options for a mid-shaft tibial fracture? Treatment options. And let me just get everybody to mute themselves. So pins and wire. Uh, uh, good idea, particularly if you don't have uh, plating equipment, remembering that when we're going to repair a fracture, we have four or five different forces that we have to counteract. And can I please ask whoever is not muted um, to mute themselves? I'm doing my best for you. You have to work with me here. Uh, let's see. I'll just mute everybody. 
Okay, you're all muted. Okay, um, so um, we've got a couple of, uh, of uh, suggestions. We've got plating, we've got external skeletal fixator, plate or X-fix, pin, and uh, locking plate construct, depends on the size. So all really good um, suggestions, just remembering that when we've got a tibial fracture or any kind of fracture, we have five different forces that we need to counteract. We have um, bending is usually the biggest force, particularly with the tibial fracture. We have compression, we have avulsion, we have rotation, and we have shearing. And so, um, let me think, no, we'll just leave it at that. So, um, so just to review those again, we have bending, compression, avulsion, shearing, rotation. Are there any other forces that I have forgotten about? I think that's about it. So we need to, when we're thinking about repairing a fracture, we need to think about the forces that are going to be um, exerted on whatever repair that we're doing and make sure that we counteract those forces. So with a mid-shaft diaphyseal long oblique fracture, bending is going to be our number one force. Um, rotation is not a big deal because we've got a long oblique. And so those two fragments are going to counteract or kind of um, going to impact on each other. Avulsion is not a big thing. Compression. Um, if you compress a fracture that's a long oblique and you haven't repaired it properly, you can have some shearing at the fracture site. Um, and please let me know if anybody is unclear on what I'm saying here. I'm going to get my iPad out and see if I can draw some stuff for you as well in just a second. Um, everybody clear on those five different forces? Uh, and let's just open up my iPad. And I'm going to open up, uh, let's see here. So I'll stop my share. And then I'll go back in and share my iPad. Uh, whiteboard, let's see, iPad, share. Uh, connect Wi Fi, self pause, tap on screen sharing. Um, Okay, so can you guys see that in the middle? Thumbs up if you can see my iPad. So we're going to the good notes here. So just have to take a minute for my pen to connect. Um, and so I'll just review those forces with you again. I'm sorry that I didn't plan on doing this ahead of time properly. Um, my iPad is not working. Anyway, I'll just charge up the pen here and I'll go back to our video. A few technical issues here. So share screen back to... Um, okay, I might be able to actually share both at the same time. Oh, let's see, shift. It's not letting me share multiple windows. No, okay. So I'll just share, go back to my video sharing. All right, so back to the um video on youtube can i get a thumbs up if you guys can see that video again all right so when we're looking at um addressing uh all those different forces um what is the force that we can counteract using an intramedullary pin so with a single im pin what force are we counteracting Bending. Okay, great. Um, and so we've got a comment saying that we are all okay with the basics. Are you guys happy for me to keep going with the basics of fracture repair, or do you want me to move on to the specifics of plating? Just type in basics or plating. Specifics. Okay, so let's move on to then 
um, the specifics of plating. So when we go into this particular fracture, there are a couple of different, so that the fractures in the middle there, there are a couple of different considerations when um, you're deciding how to repair a fracture. And um, you can either be a gardener or a carpenter. And um, the gardener is going to not disturb the uh, hematoma and just try to oppose or try to stabilize the two ends of the fracture while leaving the hematoma um, in place, whereas the carpenter is going to do a perfect anatomical repair. And I'll be honest, I, if I've got a fracture like this, um, I tend to be a carpenter just because you've got two big fracture fragments. It's in a young dog. It's going to be very easy to put this thing back together. And so um, I am, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and get an anatomical repair. So I've reduced my fracture and I'm using a, a pointed reduction force up across my fracture um, to, uh, to reduce it. Now, um, at this point, I'm applying a uh, dynamic compression plate, and this is what's called a hybrid plate. Um, and the reason why it's a hybrid plate is that we've got a hole that has um, a, a loading hole at one end away from the fracture, and then close to the fracture, it has a locking hole. Um, and so what's the advantage of a locking screw compared to a cortical screw? So a locking screw, um, the benefit is that with the head locked into the plate, in order for it to pull out, it actually has to tear through the bone instead of just shearing through the threads. Does that make sense to everybody? Um, let me just see if my, my, yeah, my iPad's working again. So uh, let me stop share and go back to my iPad. Okay, so um, when we look at a construct with a plate, if you have a non-locking screw, the screw goes through the plate and into the bone, and that screw can pivot at the head. And so when you have a locking screw, that the screw head is locked into the plate, this screw cannot pivot in the bone. And so what that means is that if you're gonna pull a plate out, let's go back a second. If you're gonna pull a plate out that has non-locking screws, what's gonna happen is that the, the screw can just pull out like this because as the plate pivots, the screw can maintain that same direction and orientation relative to the bone. So all you have to do is shear off those threads. That's in contrast to a locking plate where if you try to pull the plate off the bone, that screw is gonna maintain that orientation, that exact right angle to the plate, which means that the screw is gonna to have to tear through all that bone in order to pull out. Does that make sense to everybody? Thumbs up, please, if that makes sense. Okay, so that's the big advantage of locking screws um, when uh, uh, repairing fractures. So let me just um, close that, go back to um, the video, share. All right, so um, whenever I can, I'm going to use locking screws. So the disadvantage of locking screws is going to be that um, you can't compress the fracture. Um, when you, so when you, let me just open chat up again. Okay, so when you use loaded screws, as you tighten that screw head in, it's going to advance the two bone ends together. Whereas with a locking screw, it's just going to neutralize it. So often what we'll do is we'll put in one locking screw on one side and then load a screw on the other side, so we'll get that compression, and then lock all the other screws. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Thumbs up or a yep in the chat? All right, so um, as we keep going here, uh, so I've put in my first screw here, and let's see if that was locking or Uh, 
play. Uh, all right, so now I've got my plate on the bone and I'm gonna try to um, <clears throat> compress the plate down to the bone using a, a bone clamp. And then we are going to place our first screw. So let's see here. So I believe that I just put in a cortical screw in that one just um, because I didn't have the plate locked onto the bone um, with a clamp. I couldn't get the clamp around the back. And so I just put in a regular cortical screw. And then the next one, I'm sure I put in a locking screw. So that's the locking, um, that's the locking collar that we put in there. Give that just a minute. So once we get that locking collar in there, that's gonna make sure that the screw, the drill bit is absolutely centered in the middle of the, the screw hole. And, uh, and then we drill. And then when we put our screw down through that same, um, that same hole, it's gonna be perfectly centered in the plate and lock it in. All right, and so I am kind of old school. And so I tend to fill all of my screw holes. And I know that more, Recently, our younger surgeons tend to put in two or three screws at either end, just getting our four to six cortices and leave the central screws empty. And the reason for that is that if you have a little bit of micro motion in the center, you're going to stimulate more of a callus and you're going to get a more rapid um, uh, return to strength of that fracture. Does that make sense to everybody? So again, I tend to be old school. And so if I've got, if, if I've got empty screw holes, I'm gonna fill them. But I think probably more recently biomechanically they've shown, actually I was, I was um, more of a uh, gardener in this fracture repair uh, where I have gone in and just put in three on either end. Um, I think I must've had a resident with me that told me that I had to leave some of my screw holes empty. Um, and so that's what we've done, done in this case. Um, so continuing on here. And so then we just do a routine repair. And again, the closure on tibial fractures, um, where you uh, die seal tibial fractures are very straightforward. Um, so any difference in healing using screwdriver or motorized drill for putting in screws? So there's no difference in healing to my knowledge. The difference is going to be in pull out strength in biomechanical studies. So what they do is, um, they will uh, attach the screw head to an, what's called an instron, where they pull the screw head out and then measure the forces required to pull the screw out. And with motorized drilling, um, motorized driving, um, there's a, a moderately in, uh, significant uh, decrease in the pullout strength if you power drive your screws compared to um, hand driving your screws. I just find that with locking screws, the threads are so fine that you're just there all day. Um, uh, if you're manually uh, driving those screws, whereas with a power driver, it's very, very quick. And clinically, I have not seen an issue with that. So any questions about that? Thumbs up there. All right, so let's go back um, to our next video. So any questions about tibial fracture repair using a plate? And I am gonna be kind of brief as, as I go through these things um, because I'm trying to get through as many case, or as many videos as we can. All right, so next case is a diaphragmatic hernia. Uh, and I'll just move along here. So this is our midline abdominal exploratory. Let's just have a quick chat about our, our approach. So whenever, number one, whenever we're repairing a hernia that's communicating with the abdomen, we're always gonna go into the abdomen to repair that. You, like with a diaphragmatic hernia, you never go into the chest to repair it, always go into the hand, uh, abdomen. If you have an inguinal hernia, go into the abdomen. Um, if you have a scrotal hernia, go into the abdomen. And the reason why we're doing that is because we need to be able to, after we reduce the hernia, um, uh, assess all of the internal organs for viability. And particularly if there's a traumatic incident, we're gonna look for things like splenic ruptures and and liver uh, uh, ruptures and strangulated bowel and uh, perforated bowel and that kind of thing. So we always wanna be able to do a complete abdominal exploratory and you can't do that unless you do a midline approach. Now, the next thing that we're gonna do when we're doing um, uh, abdominal exploratories is that we're gonna make a nice long incision. You don't wanna skimp on the length of your incision because 
you want to be able to see everything. And in the words of the very wise Howard Syme, if you can't see, you can't do. So uh, if you're trying to do an abdominal exploratory through a 10 centimeter incision in anything except for a gerbil, you're not exposing enough. You need to get a complete exploratory and a complete incision. And so there's a saying that incisions heal from side to side, not end to end. Okay, so we need to make sure that we're doing a very wide, I mean, a very long abdominal exploratory. The other thing that we're gonna do that you'll notice here is that we've removed the falciform fat. So always remove the falciform fat so that we can get a better view of the cranial abdomen. And then the next thing we're gonna do is we're always gonna use Balfour retractors, or um, if you don't have Balfours, you can use Gelpi retractors. If you have like, like some nice large 15 centimeter Gelpi retractors, you can use those instead in small dogs and cats. All right, so let me just see where my chat is. I seem to have lost here. Um, so we've got our chat back. All right, any questions about that? So nice long incision. Balfour retractors remove the falciform, and we're always going to do an abdominal exploratory whenever we have a hernia. All right, so moving forward here, we can see our gallbladder in the front there, cranially, and the liver. And so I'm going to advance along here. All right, so what kind of hernia is this? So the heart is sitting up there. I want you guys in the chat to tell me what kind of hernia this is. Waiting. So in the chat, tell me what type. Say diaphragmatic hernia. I want more specifics. Okay, mediastinal. I think you're on the right track. Not a hiatal. So hiatal would be around the hiatus of the stomach. Peritoneal pericardial. That's exactly right. So how do we know that this is peritoneal pericardial? Well, we're looking right into the pericardial sac. Now, really important on these. Um, is that when you go to, and number one, these are always congenital. These cannot be traumatic. Um, number two is when we are dissecting our hernia, if it's a peritoneal pericardial, you want to avoid cutting that surface between the pericardium and the diaphragm. Because right now we are not in the thorax. This, is, this patient does not have to be ventilated. It is just an abdominal exploratory. Whereas if you cut through that structure right there, can you guys see my pointer? Can you give me a thumbs up if you can see the pointer on the screen? Can I get a thumbs up in the chat if you can see my pointer? Otherwise, anyone? Can you see my pointer? Yep, okay, great. So um, let me just come back here. Um, all right, so you have to be really careful with that dissection so that we don't go through the pericardium and into the chest cavity because this surgery becomes much more complicated if we go through that surface. And the reason it becomes more complicated is that number one, you need a ventilator, and number two, you need a chest tube. Whereas if we just repair that without going through that surface, we don't need a chest tube or a ventilator. All right, so um, as we're suturing this, we're just going to reoppose it. You do not need to freshen these edges. Just use some non-absorbable suture like, like proline or something like that. And, uh, and you do not need to freshen these edges. These will go ahead and heal um, completely. Right, just coming along here. Uh, just be a little bit careful as you're packing your sutures not to pass the suture as, like we keep all our patients on a ventilator. So if they're on inspiration with the ventilator, you don't want to use, uh, you don't want to pass your suture because you can perforate the lung. And you can see that I'm doing, instead of a simple continuous, I'm doing what's called a baseball stitch. So I'm doing a forward stitch on every bite. So you can see I'm going from the di diaphragmatic side on every bite. Um, and the reason why I do that is it's just easier for me to pass the needle in that direction. Um, in this patient, this um, cat presented with, um, signs of increased respiratory rate, uh, not increased effort. And I think it might have had some vomiting and lethargy as well. And we can see that the liver was up there just based on the appearance of the liver. And so it might've had some compression of the liver um, by, the, by the hernia. So now I'm removing the spoon from my Balfour so that I can get, um, and then I can get somebody to retract that dorsally. That's the Xiphoid sitting right there. 
just getting the spoon out of the way, wish I'd get my head out of the way, um, just to continue or to finish closing that hernia. Now, if you have liver up through the hernia, one thing that you can do, because you don't want to grab onto the liver with a pair of forceps because it'll tear through. The other thing that works nicely is you can grab onto the gallbladder using a, a very delicate thumb forcep and use that to retract on the liver. And sometimes that'll pull the liver or allow you to pull the liver back through the, um, the hernia. Uh, and the, he the diaphragm does heal across eventually. Um, we are not uh, relying on that suture um, long-term. So it does heal eventually. And I have not had these recur despite the fact that I have not freshened the ovaries. Any questions, any more questions about that? All right, so going back, let's see what our next video is. All right, so this is a maxillectomy with a, that's me a lot younger, almost no gray hair, look at that. Um, all right, so this dog um, had an oral tumor. And so what we're doing, this, this um, oral tumor was in the maxilla and it was gonna be really, really, large major maxillectomy and with a lot of blood. And so what I've done is I've gone in and done a temporary carotid artery ligation. And so what we're doing is we're putting um, Rimmel tourniquets. So you'll see that I'm, I'm wrapping a silk suture around each of the carotid arteries. Okay, and then I'm gonna pass a piece of urinary catheter through the skin and then I'm gonna pass the suture through the urinary catheter out to the other side. And then I can pull up on that suture and then just grab the urinary catheter with a hemostat. And that's going to allow me to occlude that, um, that carotid artery temporarily. So that's called a Rimmel tourniquet. Now, um, there is no risk of stroke. Um, with these dogs have so much collateral circulation, it's not like a human. And so you can actually, um, you can actually permanently ligate both carotid arteries in dogs. Uh, maybe I'd be a little bit less comfortable doing that in a cat, um, but uh, in dogs, I'm very happy to, happy to do that. Uh, I think there's a question from Piyush about putting a drain. So I would definitely not put an abdominal drain in that patient. I assume that that's what you're talking about. So anyway, what we can do by putting these Rommel tourniquets on is that I can completely close this incision and then I can apply and release the tourniquets. Um, and then when I go to remove the tourniquets, I just pull the, the uh, urethral catheter off and then cut one of the sutures and just pull the silk out without having to uh, reapproach that um, uh, those carotid arteries. So now we've got this big mass in the mouth. Um, can you guys give me five differential diagnoses for an oral tumor? Phones, excellent. You make my heart go pitter patter. Anybody else? Phones, great. So what does phones mean? So it's fibrosarcoma, osteosarcoma, acanthomatous epulis, melanoma, and squamous cell carcinoma. Those are the five common tumors that we see in the mouth. And the, the way that you remember it is that the dog foams at the mouth. So fibrosarcoma, osteosarcoma, acanthomatous epulis, melanoma, squamous cell carcinoma. All right, so this particular tumor, I can't tell which one it is. They often look very similar. I think it is unlikely to be a squamous cell carcinoma. It is unlikely to be a um, uh, acanthomatous epulis because this is quite large, it turned out to be a fibrosarcoma um, in this patient. And so what we're doing is a first thing that we do when I approach the caudal maxilla is I'm going to do a chyloplasty, which means that I'm going to open up that cheek to increase my exposure. So just stretching it all the way back so that I can get a better exposure. You can see that I'm behind now the caudal most molar up here. So it's gonna give us a lot better idea or a lot better visualization. So then I'm going to cut through the mucosa. I'm giving myself a margin 
Now, fibrosarcomas in the mouth, what are they known for? So tell me, tell me a fact about oral fibrosarcomas. A couple of different things about them. Number one, they're called low-grade, high-grade fibrosarcomas. And the reason why is that um, they appear histologically to be very low-grade. They can even look just like fibrous tissue, but they behave in a much more malignant fashion with high rates of recurrence and much higher metastatic rate than what would be predicted from the appearance histologically. So metastatic rate in oral fibrosarcomas is about 20 to 25%. They occur most frequently in golden retrievers. I think in one study, 55% uh, of the dogs were golden retrievers. The other thing is that they are associated with the highest rate of local recurrence of any tumor that I removed. So out of all the tumors anywhere in the body, oral fibrosarcomas are the ones that have the highest local recurrence rate. So they are the ones that scare me the most. If I'm having a conversation with a client about an oral fibrosarcoma, I'm going to tell them that the risk of local recurrences is upwards of 50%. All right, so we're doing our um, uh, cutting through the mucosa here. I'm happy to cut through with the electric artery. And then we're going to extend that incision all the way down to the bone. Uh, there's a big maxillary artery right there that you want to identify before you cut it, ideally. And then we'll ligate that with some silk. So I've isolated that nice, I've got power clamps on the lip mucosa. And I'm gonna come through with a saw. You can also do this with an osteotome. And what I wanna do is I wanna cut with the saw as late as possible in the procedure. Cause once I start cutting here, that's when you're gonna start getting bleeding. So you wanna make sure that you have cut through as much of your soft tissue as possible before you get that prolific bleeding. Cause you don't want it bleeding internally and then not be able to get to those bleeders. You can see I'm doing the part that's inside the mouth. I'm using an osteotome now. And it helps to have counter pressure. So if somebody puts their thumb on the opposite side of the maxilla, that helps um, uh, improve the effectiveness, the effectiveness of the osteotome. Now, uh, your osteotomes should be really, really sharp. And if they're not sharp, send them off and get them sharpened because uh, they're gonna be a lot safer a lot easier to use if they're as sharp as a woodworking chisel. Okay, so now we cut through all the bone. I've got one bleeder there. I'll grab onto that with a thumb forcep. And then this was before I had ligature. Um, question if I use local blocks here. Um, I think that it's too far caudal to do an infraorbital block, but I would definitely infuse um, mepivacaine um, uh, after the excision uh, because local mepivacaine is gonna provide a lot of good pain relief. Um, so in, interesting here, I have not actually entered the nasal cavity. So this is nasal mucosa on the inside right here. And so I'm not in the nasal cavity, so we don't have to worry about creating an oral nasal fissure. That brings me to the next point is that the most common complication acutely after surgery is uh, oral nasal fistula, and they can be quite frustrating and difficult to manage. So I always warn my owners that an oral nasal fistula is a possibility. Okay, now in closure, I'm just gonna close my mucosa here from the cheek down to the hard palate, and it's very helpful to drill some holes in the hard palate to keep that from dehissing. So, um, here I am not, um, uh, I have not drilled holes um, and I'm going to regret it because I bet this is going to dehiss. So then I'm uh, closing my lip commissure here and I want to spend a lot of time closing that, making sure that it's very secure because if you're going to get dehiscence, it's going to be at the commissure of the lip. And then uh, we close the rest of the mucosa and the skin. So there's a question about, um, 
salivary gland compl complications, and we don't see anything in this area as far as that's concerned. Um, the other thing that we could do is um, uh, we could put in a wound soaker catheter, which is where we put in a, um, a urinary catheter that we've increased the number of fenestrations, and then we're going to inject mepivacaine or bupivacaine every four to six hours after surgery. Just makes these dogs so much more comfortable. Any questions about that? All right, moving on to perineal mass removal. Here's me again, very young. Um, so, okay, so we've got a peri, uh, perineal or perianal mass. Um, what is our most likely diagnosis here? Anyone? So perianal mass is just in general, what do we think about? I'm not gonna go on until somebody gives me some uh, ideas. Okay, adenoma, mast cell tumor, mast cell tumor. Anything else in the perianal region? Anal sac adenocarcinoma. Why do we know that this is not an anal sac adenocarcinoma? Because it's in the skin. Anal sac adenocarcinomas are always deeper than that. Okay, any, so fibrosarcoma, good, good idea. Um, any comments about the behavior of mast cell tumors in the mucocutaneous junction? Are they more aggressive or less aggressive? In the chat, please. More aggressive or less aggressive? Mast cell tumors of the mucocutaneous junction. Put that question mark there. More aggressive. That's exactly right. So um, mast cell tumors of the mucocutaneous junction are more aggressive than cutaneous mast cell tumors. Um, when we look at the comment down here, we can see that it was a grade 2A, so it was a low grade 2, which means its metastatic rate is only about 5%. So not all of them are going to be high grade, but I'm always a little bit concerned when I see a mast cell tumor of the mucocutaneous junction. Now, this um, dog, uh, we're, we're right on to the anal sphincter. Are we worried about that, yes or no? So I'm not worried about that at all. If I'm only cutting through the anal sphincter on one side, we don't have to worry about incontinence. And I've never seen a dog become incontinent after even huge, you know, tennis ball size anal sac adenocarcinoma. So um, we don't have to be particularly concerned about that. Even if we have to take full thickness, full thickness anal sphincter, we're going to get our two centimeter margins no matter what. Um, we're going to send it off for histopath. Where are we going to look for metastatic lesions in this dog? Um, so generally, sublumbar lymph nodes would be my first point of call, and so it would be a good idea uh, probably to get an ultrasound of the abdomen or at least do a good rectal palpation to see if those anal sacs are enlarged, recognizing that enlargement of anal sacs or lack of enlargement of um, lymph nodes, sorry, is not an absolute indicator that you don't have metastasis. So you still ought to be doing um, lymph node experts. All right, so... Doing our wide local excision here. Moving my ruptured artery, getting our two centimeter margin. That nice thick skin margin, or uh, fat margin that we've got. Sorry about the two big heads in the way. We are surgeons though, so we have to have big heads. Uh, and I will have taken some of the anal sphincter here. And we just want to reconstruct that. So that's the tumor there that we've removed, nice wide margin. We're down two anal sphincter, but we haven't gone full thickness. So this dog will not have any issue with incontinence. You can see the anal sphincter sitting right there. Um, Aubrey, sorry you did miss the tibial fracture. It was first, but I will upload the recording um, when I'm finished. So then we're just closing this primarily in several layers. Um, get closure of dead space. This is not one that I would feel like we needed to put a drain in. In fact, I would say that we do, uh, uh, we do not need to put a drain in, particularly in this area with feces potentially running into it. It's going to really increase our infection rate. All right, any questions about that? 
I think we'll skip the toe, uh, toe amputation, skull mass. Uh, let's go on to the, um, so there's no concern about tension on the anus in, in this area. You can do a, a little rotational flap if you need to. Um, so we've already done a big skull mass, um, extra capsular repair. Let me go through that quickly. So this is um, a technique that I do for my extra capsular sutures, um, which I find really helpful to get around the fabella. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do is a uh, parapetellar approach. And so uh, we're going to do a lateral, sorry, a lateral parapetellar approach. Use Gelpi retractors. You have to use Gelpies in order to, open, to get a good look in here. And if you are um, having trouble luxating the patella, it's because you have not exposed far enough proximally. The problem is not distal ever. Next thing you need to do is you always need to use a Sen retractor in order to get a look at the cruciate ligament and the meniscus. And you always need to visualize the meniscus. If you can't visualize the meniscus, um, you need to modify your approach rather than just say, oh, we don't need to look at the meniscus. All right, so you need to uh, use our Homan retractor behind the tibial plateau and that's going to allow us to visualize the meniscus. And I'm sorry that, um, that this video uh, does not show us looking at the meniscus more clearly. There's a question here. In the hymen, can we remove the superficial and deep digital flexor? Will it uh, affect mobility on the limb? So I assume that you're talking about a distal um, metatarsal or metacarpal um, tumor on the palmar surface where we can go in and remove the flexor tendons, you can definitely remove um, the flexor tendons without any problem. Um, if you remove both the deep and the superficial, the toes will be somewhat hyperextended, but the function is still good, and it's certainly better than amputating the limb. Hope that answers your question. All right, so I've done my arthrotomy over here um, for my exocapture suture. I'm gonna flush the joint suction that out. So we've looked at our cruciate, we've looked at our meniscus, and then I like to close my um, joint capsule as soon as I can, because the shorter period of time you have the joint capsule open, the less likely you are to get a septic arthritis. So I'm closing my joint capsule separate from the fascia lata. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna increase my exposure to the lateral fabella there caudally. So I'm gonna approach that and you should be able to palpate the fabella with your finger very clearly and you should be able to see it. Now, the trick that I do here is that I'll take a 14 gauge needle and pass it from lateral straight to medial immediately distal to the fabella. And then, so I've got that distal, let's just see if I can play this here. So I've put in my needle distal to the fabella and it feels very firm because that's a very tight space in there. And then I'm gonna reach around the top and grab the, so you can see the fabella sitting right there and I've got my needle going from medial from lateral to medial. Now I'm gonna pass my suture through that needle. Okay, so you can see the suture, the, the fishing line that I'm passing through the needle. And then I'm gonna reach around the other side and grab that with a right angle force. So that right angle is there. I've grabbed on to the needle with my right angle. And then I'm gonna pass my suture through the needle. And then I'm going to pull the needle out very slightly until all that's left in the right angle forcep is the suture. Does that make sense to everybody? Can I get a yes if that makes sense? Yes on the chat or a no? Yes? I need to explain that again. All good? Okay, so um, I got one no here. So we've got the fabella there. I'm going to pass my 14 gauge needle through the, uh, the tissue distal to the fabella. And then I'm gonna reach around and grab the 
needle with my right angle forces. And then I'm gonna pass my suture through the needle and push it out like five centimeters or two centimeters beyond the needle. And then I'm gonna very carefully remove my needle very slowly so that all that's left in the jaws of the forcep is the suture. And then I'm gonna use that to pull the suture around the back. Um, I will go through the tibial hole in, uh, landmarks in a minute. Um, and in trapping the perineal branch, I'm not sure, um, uh, I'm not sure where they went wrong. We, we should be looking at the fabella. Um, we should, <clears throat> and you're talking about the perineal nerve or artery. I assume you're talking about the perineal nerve. Um, you should be able to see what you're doing there. So there's a question, um, why not just use a half circle needle? You can use that, but the problem that I find is that sometimes it's hard to get the needle around the fabella. The other problem is that sometimes, depending on the size of the, size of the needle, you can entrap a lot of soft tissue in there. And the entrapment of soft tissue does two things. Number one, it makes your suture loose. And number two, um, it causes them to be painful after the surgery. So if you are having success with your half circle needle, definitely do that. If you're struggling to get a good tight um, suture or a uh, fishing line around the fabella, then you can try this technique. All right, so passing that suture through, and then I'm very carefully removing that needle and all that's left is the suture in the right angle. Now, when I'm passing my um, needle in the tibial tuberosity, I'm gonna go into my iPad so that I can draw a picture for you. So let me stop the share and I'll go into my iPad. Okay, so um, when you have your proximal tibia, like this, you have your femur up here, I'm gonna draw three different holes. One, I'm gonna call this A, B, C. So give me a vote on where we are going to put our, um, where we're gonna put our tibial suture, A, B, or C. Okay, I've got a B, A, A. Like everybody to vote, please. B. Okay, so when we are running our suture, the fabella is up here. And so our suture is coming from here. Let me just change color so you can see. Our suture is coming from here. All right, we are trying to emulate the function of the cruciate ligament. The cruciate ligament inserts in the tibial plateau right there. So that's our cruciate ligament. So we want to um, get as close as we can to what's called an isometric point. The isometric point is the point that as you run the leg through a range of motion, that point is going to stay the same distance from the fabella suture. So the problem is that if you have it in a non-isometric point, the suture is going to tighten and loosen as it runs through a range of motion. And so as close as we can get to an isometric point is point A, right underneath that tibial plateau. And so that is just in front or behind your extensor groove, which is where a longitudinal extensor tends to run. So point A is the place where you want to place your suture. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? And remember that if you put it all the way down here in point C, your, your, your suture is running in this direction and your cranial drawer is in this direction. So your suture is not even countering the motion or the instability that you're trying to resolve. So stop that share there and go back into 
a video presentation. Okay, so, um, and I am probably a little bit too far cranial with this suture placement. Now I do use my 14 gauge needle again to pass my suture and you can just pass it using your fingers. You don't need to um, drive it with a pin or drive it with a, a, a drill. So I just use that one to pass it underneath the patella tendon. And then I'm using the needle to pass from lateral to medial. Again, that's a 14 gauge needle. And sometimes you'll blunt the needle and so you'll have to replace it. Okay, and then you get a little bone core that comes out that you'll have to get rid of. So we're gonna push that little bone core out. Little bone biopsy. Okay, and then we're going to pass our suture back through in that direction. And then you just pull your needle out. Uh, remember that these are all on YouTube. And so if you want to go back and review. Um, now, the other thing is that we like to use crimps rather than tying knots. I think that the knot, um, that the length of that knot, that very stiff suture, um, causes a lot of pain and the crimp is a lot lower profile. How many of you guys hand tie versus crimp? Can you give me a, a vote? Hand tie versus crimp? Crimp, crimp, great. Um, so the type of suture material here is um, just fishing line. If you're using um, the ortho wire or whatever, then you're probably going to have to tie that. I don't know that if the crimping system works very well with that. So then we're gonna have that pulled fairly tight and then we're gonna come back and crimp. Now I haven't done an extra capsule suture in probably about five years. Um, I do almost all TPLOs. Um, and so you guys probably have more um, experience um, with this than I do certainly recently. Um, and uh, fiber right wire is a good option. Um, just make sure that you're not pulling it too tight because if it's too tight, you're gonna squish your meniscus as it runs through range of motion. Yeah, any questions or comments about that? And then we're just going to do a routine uh, fascial closure. And you can augment your repair by doing a uh, fascial imbrication um, using a vest, vest over pants suture pattern as well. Uh, this only had two crimps. All right, so coming back and going to our next case here um, gastrostomy two placement in the dog. Um, so how many of you are comfortable putting in esophagostomy tubes? Comfortable with esophagostomy tubes? So this is when you have esophageal dysfunction. So if you have dis esophageal dysfunction, you have to bypass the esophagus. And so we're doing a grid approach into the abdomen. all the way down until we get in there. And then we're gonna just reach around, palpate around until we find the stomach. And we want, this is the left um, side of the dog. So we want the fundus of the stomach. And often what I'll do is I'll grab onto it using a, a towel clamp. And then I'm suturing the stomach to the internal abdominal oblique muscle of the body wall. And what that's going to do is that if the feeding tube pulls out prematurely, we're not going to get peritonitis. Okay, so then I'm taking my Pezzer feeding tube, make a little incision in stomach, and then I'm going to grab onto the end of the feeding tube and stretch it out so that the mushroom tip is stretched so that it's easier to get into the stomach. So you'll see that it can be difficult to pop that in. If it's difficult, you can just pull that and stretch it out. So now I'm also going to put a purse string around the feeding tube so that we're going to create a seal around it because these, if they pull out prematurely, you do have the potential of getting peritonitis. So just a purse string all the way around the inside. 
Now we do have a vet dojo module on everything you need to know about feeding tubes um, from esophagostomy tubes to jejunostomy tubes to gastrostomy tubes, what to feed them, complications, how to avoid them, et cetera, if you're interested. So it's just www.vetdojo.com and you'll find the link in our YouTube channel as well. So then I'm just going to do a uh, uh, I'm also doing a pexy of this of the stomach to the intradermal or the dermis as well. So I'm really trying to be absolutely sure that I'm not going to have a problem with leakage. Okay, any questions about that? Uh, so I'm going to stop the screen share here. Okay, um, so that's all the videos that I'm going to go through now. Was this a helpful review of techniques? If so, um, I can do this um, a lot, you know, a lot more in the future. It's a very easy uh, presentation for me to prepare, and I can just review um, review our videos on YouTube. So if you found that helpful, that's great. Um, I am going to upload this to YouTube um, as soon as we're finished. And um, I think that's pretty much it. Are there any questions that I can answer about anything related to this or um, any of our vet dojo modules or any questions related to surgery at all? All right, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Thanks a lot for watching. Um, and I'm not live streaming anymore this week. I'm off clinics for the rest of the week. Um, but I'll be back in on Monday and I'll try to start um, getting some more live streams up again. Talk to you soon.